everyone's in a good place and can hear and see us. But um, very happy to have you. We're delighted um, to be joined by so many colleagues. It's nice to have some of you in the room and, and thank you again for patience online. Um, today we're celebrating Sustainable Food System Month on AgriLinks. Uh, I'm Trish Stroman. I'm a managing director and senior partner with BCG. For the past 18 years, I've worked at the intersection of the public and private sector to solve complex development challenges. Um, sometimes that's you know long-term intractable problems like malaria and, and HIV with our colleagues at USAID, um, and also you know, regularly support the important work of our agricultural and food system teams to strengthen livestock production in Africa and many other food systems issues. So when we heard the opportunity to host this panel discussion, we were truly delighted by the chance to bring together this group of change makers, thought leaders, practitioners, and donors across the climate, food system, and NRM communities. Special thanks to our colleagues at USAID and particularly Emily Weeks for moderating the panel discussion and, and for suggesting our topic for today, which is building partnerships and solutions for just and sustainable food systems. In our rapidly evolving world, this topic is critical. We need to look closely at the roles that each one of us and our respective organizations can play to ensure that we're working towards a just transition and that we're thinking through financial, technological, economic, and social considerations as we work. You'll hear today from experts across many organizations. So we have colleagues from USAID, Winrock International, APT Associates, WWF, and BCG. They'll each share emerging solutions and articulate some of the critical building blocks necessary to achieve sustainable food systems. The panelists will address the key role of partnerships and most importantly, talk about how we can actually start implementing some of these solutions both internationally and locally. So with that, I will turn it over to Emily Weeks, a senior policy advisor at USAID to introduce our first guest speaker. Thanks, Emily. Thank you, Trish. Thank you so much for inviting me here today to moderate today's session. We're really excited to have this session in person. It's something that we haven't had the opportunity to do before uh, since COVID, particularly with our AgriLinks month. Uh, we're very excited to start off our session today with uh, Deputy Assistant Administrator Bama Athria, uh, who is the Assistant Administrator in Gender Equality, Women's Empowerment Hub, and Inclusive Development Hub in the uh, Bureau for Development, Democracy, and Innovation. So I'll start off by handing it over to you, Obama, and, uh, and then we'll get started with our panel session. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, um, Emily, and thank you so much to everyone who's here today. Really, really delighted to be able to open up this important discussion. My name is Bama Athreya. My pronouns are she and her. And I just want to start by acknowledging that here in downtown Washington, DC, we are on the land of the Nacotchtank people. My framing of today's discussion is really going to focus on the importance of addressing equity, of addressing social inclusion and gender equality. And this is something that I know this group has been thinking about, not just this month, but for a long time. But nevertheless, I think it behooves us to step back and repeat some things which perhaps we all know, but perhaps we don't actually remind ourselves or others often enough. And one of those things is that for a very long time, our development approach to food security has overemphasized the technical and the technological. We see systems through a technological lens. This has been true certainly ever since the Green Revolution, science was going to solve world hunger. And yet, even in those days, in the 1970s, the seminal work by uh, economist Esther Basarup reminded us that food systems could not work, would not work, without the vast amount of unpaid labor contributed by women in agricultural communities around the world. That was the 1970s, and yet today, those unpaid care burdens faced by women in these communities have barely changed, barely changed. So this is why I want to start by reminding us that for all that we have the data about rising inequality, for all that we see continued exclusion and marginalization of communities on the basis of race, ethnicity, indigenous status and other statuses, we still 
aren't really taking a systems lens that emphasizes social systems as much as technological systems. And we need to do so if we really want to make sure that those who are most vulnerable, most likely to face food insecurity, have their needs addressed. And to do this, we need to not put the decision making solely in the hands of people who will always be food secure. We know that one of the problems in the world today is that inequality has resulted in a very few having quite a lot, indeed to excess. And I am sometimes reminded of uh, the scene in the uh, young adult novel Hunger Games, or the movie if you've seen it, where in, in the capital city, people have so much that they, there's a banqu famous banquet scene where they literally regurgitate in order to be able to go in and eat more. That's how much folks have. Now that's, you know, that's fiction, that's parody. But I feel like some of the contexts we work in sometimes remind me of Panem, that fictional place. And in order to address this, what, what I think people in some of these places may perceive as quite that level of disparity between those who have to vast excess and those who don't, we have to look at social exclusion. Okay. We have to look at what those social dynamics are and how we can change them. So let me say a few words now about how we are doing that at USAID because our approach is evolving just as I think many of your organizations have an evolving approach to understanding the need to centralize work to address equity and inclusion. We have elevated our gender commitments. USAID, as many of you know, for a very long time has had a commitment to gender equality. Our first agency-wide policy on gender equality and women's empowerment was adopted in 2010, and I'm very pleased to report that we've just released a new and updated policy as of a couple of months ago, just earlier this year, that is really up to the minute in terms of thinking about the best ways to embed gender equality across all USAID programming. We've also made great advances in our thinking about social inclusion. We now have an inclusive development hub that was established in 2020 and brings together many of the streams of work which were focused on individual populations and which were doing you know, very well at elevating the needs of those populations. But by bringing that work together, we now are able to take an intersectional approach and recognize that people are never simply a single story, as the author Chimananda Chidi has put it. We, within the Inclusive Development Hub, we are elevating our uh, policy on promoting the rights of indigenous peoples. Uh, we have a new youth policy that was updated and released last year. And we are looking forward later in uh, June during Pride Month to releasing a newly updated LGBTQ plus policy. So in addition to policies, we provide technical assistance to our missions around the world uh, on how to better integrate the considerations of all marginalized and, and underrepresented communities in our work. Today, I'm going to focus largely on how we're doing that uh, with respect to women in food systems, gender equality in food systems, and the work to uh, ensure that we are embedding a lens that elevates and centralizes local communities and particularly indigenous communities. Uh, because as I was saying a minute ago, we need to make sure that the decision making isn't simply uh, I left in the hands of those that aren't living the, the realities of food insecurity and that we're bringing all these voices into our decision making as well as into our, pro our programs as participants. So just starting with gender, women, as you all know, are critical to food systems and globally make up approximately 43% of the agricultural labor force. Now, when we say agricultural labor force, this does not include, again, that vast amount of unpaid care labor without which the labor forces that are literally harvesting or, or working in uh, I food systems could be, um, could be employed. So despite the fact that they make up a, you know, really quite a significant proportion of uh, labor in food systems, they are facing inequity in all aspects. We need to engage all of uh, these communities, women and girls, indigenous peoples, youth and others in designing food systems that meet 
the needs for sustainable, uh, healthy, affordable, and culturally appropriate foods. So how can we do this? I have talked about um, the role of local and indigenous communities briefly. And what I want to say now is just to emphasize that for too long we've ignored or worse undermined some of the important and longstanding knowledge of local and indigenous communities that have retained really important sustainable traditional practices over generations. And we need to learn from these practices. This is what we mean by putting them into decision making. Let us look at what they have done over sometimes generations to ensure their own communities could maximize their food security. Incorporating local and indigenous knowledge and community practices into food systems makes our systems more resilient. They integrate local practices that address soil degradation, water and food waste, climate change, and biodiversity loss. Whether it's by creating floating gardens in flood-prone Bangladesh, intercropping traditional crops in Kenya to reduce soil erosion, or building clam gardens to protect mollusks in the Pacific Northwest, indigenous and local communities are tackling all of these problems. They are important guardians of the world's biodiversity. And as stewards of many of the world's most critical ecosystems and resources, indigenous and local communities have long known how to integrate natural resource management into their food systems. If you have looked at USAID's new climate strategy, which was released last year, you'll see that one of the pillars actually specifically focuses on the need to work with indigenous and local communities. And I think what I'm doing here is just really spelling out a little bit of why that is so important. But again, you'll see that this is the direction that we have, have set for ourselves as an agency and for our partners around the world. As an example of how we're doing this, the Indigenous Peoples Alliance for Rights and Development in Panama uh, is a uh, partner to USAID. And we are also partnering with the Food and Agriculture Organization uh, under this program to develop the bylaws for indigenous, for indigenous peoples themselves to develop the bylaws for their self-governance and seek free prior and informed consent for programmatic activities as they strengthen the value chain of their coconut production to ensure greater value for the community and for the country. I am now going to just speak for a, f a minute or two about um, the status of women and the importance of gender equality and closing the persistent gender gap in food systems. As the FAO's recent report on the status of women in agri-food systems points out so clearly, women do continue to be marginalized. That report tells us that the agri-food systems are a major employer of women worldwide, globally. 36% of working women are employed in these systems, but they're still facing discriminatory social and gender norms, including gender-based violence, which is all too pervasive throughout global workplaces. They are paid less, have fewer access to resources and fewer inputs, and their work conditions are plagued by informality, irregularity, and insecurity. One case study in Senegal found that, on average, in agri-food systems, women's wages were 24% lower than men's wages. But the report also noted that if we were to close these gender gaps, we could significantly increase the incomes of 58 million people and increase the resilience of 235 million people worldwide. So we are working to close these gaps. At USAID, we're helping women smallholders increase their access to needed information, seeds, finance, and other tools to succeed. We're also helping them to secure their rights over land and natural resources to reduce vulnerability, increase voice and decision making, and protect these important assets. Um, one sector where we're doing this, and, and one I'd like to highlight, is in the fisheries sector. I think, again, this audience may know, but in case you don't, that this is a great example of a, a sector where USAID has made a systematic effort to conduct the analysis to understand women's role in fisheries, produce tools and resources to guide our missions around the world on how they could better integrate considerations to elevate gender equality uh, in fishery sectors and uh, really bring women in to, you know, to ensure they are working at all levels of the value chain as they uh, do play a critical role in systems now and can play an elevated role. I would also like to just uh, for a minute highlight something that hopefully you have heard about and that is our uh, new Generating Resilience and Opportunities for Women or GROW initiative that was announced by Administrator Power uh, just last month. And this is a uh, initiative that will invest up to 335 million through our Feed the Future initiative. 
To highlight just a few of the things that will do the lines of effort, in close collaboration with country governments, implementing partners in local communities, GROW will advance women's empowerment across three priority areas. Increasing women producers' productivity and resilience to shocks, supporting women to fully participate and benefit from more diversified and climate resilient economic opportunities in food and water systems, and driving the humanitarian system to prioritize addressing the unique needs of women and girls affected by climate and food security crises. Uh, in our offices, we're investing more and more in ensuring that we are elevating local, women-led organizations to play a role in this and similar initiatives addressing food security and the climate crisis simultaneously while advancing our important gender goals. So I hope this, that these few examples have uh, whetted your appetite for today's discussion. Again, really pleased to be, have the opportunity to open this important discussion. Very appreciative of the work that all of you are doing uh, here in the U.S. and around the world to tackle these important systems challenges and look forward to hearing more from all of you. Thank you so much. Back to you, Emily. Thank you so much, Deputy Assistant Administrator Obama. These are some really critical points that have been made, and it's great to hear some examples from the USAID portfolio. As we've highlighted today, the topic is around just and sustainable food systems, and as Deputy Assistant, Assistant Administrator Obama has highlighted, that we need these in combination to really ensure that we meet our food security goals. So I'm delighted again to be moderating today's panel session and looking forward to introducing our panelists here today. Before I bring our panelists onto the stage, I just want to highlight what questions we will be addressing today. We are looking at how to build partnerships and ensure equitable processes for sustainable food systems, but also maintaining long-term solutions for these processes. So our panelists will work through these questions and highlight from their experience across our partner agencies of how we do address key partnerships in building them and also ensuring that we're all inclusive. Just ensuring that we're on the same page in regards to what we mean as inclusive and sustainable. So in this case, we're talking about sustainability across both long-term food resilience, food system resilience, but also in engaging and ensuring that we're maintaining our natural resources, making sure that we're mainstreaming that across our portfolios of work to, make, to ensure that we meet our food security goals. As far as inclusive, as Deputy Assistant Administrator Obama highlighted, we're looking at engaging and empowering all persons, regardless of their identity, women, youth, indigenous peoples, and marginalized communities. So with that, how do we put this all into practice? This is what our, our panelists will discuss today. So it's my privilege to introduce our panelists and starting with Eric Reading from, our, from APT Associates. He is our Chief Climate Officer at APT Associates and I'd, I'd like to introduce you to come onto the stage. Uh, Kahir Dahani, Managing Director and Partner at BCG, welcome. Aaron Sudsmo, Associate Vice President of Winrock International, and Susie Friedman, Senior Director of Policy at World Wildlife Fund. As you can see, we have a nice group here with us today, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. So thank you for joining us. So I'm just going to kick us off with our first question of the day, uh, looking across the term sustainability, um, what it is uh, what it means to achieve sustainable food systems. And I'd like to start with Susie um, from WWF's perspective. What are the key building blocks to achieve our sustainable food systems that we need across different scales, international, national, and local? And handing it over to you, Susie, I think I'll just have to, oh, there's a microphone, perfect. Uh, now? Yeah. Okay, great. 
Thank you so much for including me here today. And I really struggled with how to talk about just a few of the key building blocks uh, for a just and sustainable food system. But um, I want to highlight uh, just a few of those. I could go on for much longer. But the three I really want to focus on today are deforestation and conversion, uh, sustainable protein, and sustainable water use in agriculture. There are many more that are really important, but these are the three I'm going to highlight here today. Some of the world's most valuable natural ecosystems, forests, grasslands, savannas, peatlands, among others, are being destroyed at an alarming rate. And these crucial natural ecosystems are, uh, really help, are really critical to helping regulate the environment, support food security, as well as human health and um, livelihoods, um, and really important to uh, regulating uh, climate change. The threats to forests are generally well known, but the threats to forests are often, I mean, to, uh, to grasslands are often overlooked. And yet grasslands are the most threatened and least protected ecosystems in the world, and only a few large tracts remain. In fact, in America, we've lost 70% of our, of our grasslands. And yet grasslands are critical for biodiversity in nature, hold approximately one-third of terrestrial uh, carbon stocks and provide critical resilience in the face of climate change. Much of this deforestation and conversion is driven by agricultural commodities. And we need these agri agricultural commodities. We need them to survive, we need them for food security, but we also need to find ways to produce them without driving this kind of conversion. And these uh, commodities include beef, soy, palm oil, wood fiber, cocoa, coffee, and rubber. Globally, food systems are the primary drivers of land use change and conversion, biodiversity loss, and contribute one-third of global greenhouse gas em emissions. So the real urgency is that we need to be able to feed 10 billion people by 2050 without further destroying nature, further exacerbating climate change, and compromising our ability to feed future generations. So the real opportunity is to be able to bridge the gap between agricultural, food, climate, and nature policy. So I want to highlight a few things we need to stop, a few things we need to do more of, and a few things we need to do better. So we need to stop subsidizing unsustainable forms of agriculture, tolerating corruption and failing to punish illegal deforestation, and enabling unsustainable supply chains and human rights abuses. What we need to do more of, we need to strengthen uh, local tenure rights for indigenous peoples and local communities, we need to strengthen enforcement budgets and training for extension services for forest conservation and conservation of grasslands. And we need to do better public monitoring of deforestation and, and co conversion. And better invest in public-private partnerships and investments that advance sustainable, and sustainable forest management and grassland conservation. And here are some things that we need to do better. Improve payment for ecosystem services and mechanisms that reward farmers for sustainable management. Better support zero deforestation and conversion-free commitments by companies, and better regulations on imported wood from countries with deforestation and address uh, international land speculation. So now I want to turn to sustainable protein. Animal source commodities are a critical part of food security and livelihoods, especially for smallholders and indigenous communities. And well-managed livestock can be a really critical part of, support, of supporting healthy ecosystems. But right now, there are major drivers of greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity loss, land use change, and soil and water degradation. And global meat production has quadrupled over the past 50 years and brought with it increased impacts, including being 11% of global greenhouse gas emissions, 12% of global freshwater consumption, and between 1961 and 2011, being 65% of global land use change. So what we need to do is better support sustainable protein and connect biodiversity and climate targets with livestock production. Right now, I don't think there are any countries that have emission targets that are connected to livestock. So there's a real opportunity to support and enable governments to develop policies to support sustainable protein, drive innovations in markets and finance, and create more enabling um, environments to capitalize on opportunities to proactively partner with the private sector. Two key things I want to call out here are feed and traceability. 
Sust sustainable feed is a really key part of enabling sustainable protein because feed is such a large part of the footprint of, the, of, of sustainable protein. The key parts of this really are sustainable sourcing. Where is that feed coming from? And conversion is a big part of that. So being able to address the conversion part of feed. Um, uh, regenerative agriculture, how is that feed produced? And making sure we really have policies in place to support the sustainability of feed production. The circularity of feed, and one real innovation here can be bringing food waste into animal feed and creating more circularity there. And then innovations in feed, particularly to reduce enteric um, emissions from, from animals. And then in traceability, uh, there's a growing amount of interest from, um, from uh, consumers to understand better where their uh, protein is coming from, understand the environmental footprint from corporations to be able to meet uh, corporate sustainability commitments and from producers interested in making environmental, uh, making their uh, animals more, uh, their uh, livestock more environmentally friendly, but being able to make that economically viable. All of this requires a greater certain degree of traceability and that requires better measurement. And so we really need to be investing in the measurement um, that can uh, enable this kind of traceability, making this economically viable and support Supporting responsible supply chains. Finally, I want to mention water. We all rely on water. Uh, sustainable and just food systems rely on water. And groundwater, which is the most abundant sort of source of fresh water available to humans, um, is largely unseen and unprotected, despite the fact that groundwater supports 50% uh, of all freshwater ecosystems. And right now it is being uh, overexploited, especially for agriculture, which threatens ecosystems and infrastructure and food security. Right now, 25% of global irrigated food production relies on unsustainable groundwater extraction. And food security is also at risk from growing threats to rivers, which support one third of global food production. So a few basic things I want to call out here that can really help advance improved management of water. Measure and manage, set sustainable limits, recharge and replenish, and reduce demand and maintain balance. With that, I will hand it back to you. Thank you, Susie. That is a, uh, a really great overview of all the foundational challenges and interventions that we can uh, utilize to address those challenges, particularly from the lens of the natural environment and what we need to address in regards to uh, protection and conservation of our resources. Moving on to Erin, noting the global and regional perspective and how critical that is, I wanted to hone into the community level and uh, ask you to speak on behalf of, of um, Winrock on some of the local communities' uh, engagement that you've had that drive long-term solutions. Thanks so much, Emily, and it's a pleasure to be here with uh, all of you today. Um, as we think about those building blocks for sustainable food systems, and from our work often, um, we're the implementer that's working hand in hand with uh, communities and uh, across the different um, sectors within the system to try to put together that range of partners that we need to develop these solutions. So as we think about the sustainable food systems, um, from our side, we put those into three pillars, um, uh, the economic, the environmental, um, and the social. Um, and I'll just highlight where we're starting to change our approach as Winrock, as we've been doing this work for some decades, um, but continue to try to learn and adapt some of our program. And so I'll just highlight a couple places that are at inflection plate in, in inflection points of uh, the work that we're doing. Um, uh, first of all, on the economic side. And what I mean by that, if what we put into this bucket is um, to Susie's point um, of how do we generate that healthy diets um, for each and every person, and especially the marginalized populations that have been left behind. How do we ensure water security? And how do we ensure the livelihoods of those rural populations that are going to be resilient and mitigate risk in the face of climate change. This is an extreme challenge. Um, how do we do this requires a, a tremendous amount of partnering. Where we are changing some of our approach is now adopting a climate smart market systems model. 
um, where we're increasing the role and coordination together with the private sector, but not only with the private sector, both with our small scale producers, um, cooperatives, and uh, women's groups, savings groups that we've been working with for decades at Winrock. Um, too often, we weren't doing that with a profit motive in mind and the business case, both from the producer side as well as from the agribusiness side. And so we're starting with those conversations, putting that farmer first um, model in place to say farmers are diverse. Um, we can't bring a individual farmer to say they represent farmers because they certainly represent themselves. How do we ensure that that conversation is inclusive? And to uh, Assistant Administrator Obama's point, how are we ensuring that we're including women um, in this conversation? How are we taking a look at the role they play in the individual value chains, which value chains they're in? And then as we take a look at water security, what are the individual and differential needs that are different demographic populations face, and they face very different circumstances, um, many of which have been systemically marginalized somewhat intentionally um, by power structures that are in place. And we need to develop systems and responses that address those and address those differently. Additionally, we have to quantify where each of those demographics um, are at and so that we can measure whether we are making progress. And so putting that monitoring in place is extremely critical. And so as far as those solutions, that partnership between our producers and our community organizations, our aggregated um, uh, uh, farmer groups, together with the private sector to identify what are those commercializable climate smart solutions, meaning what are the practices, what are the technologies, what are the services that are both going to be profitable for the producers as well as for the agribusinesses. Um, and so we have been working to identify what is that individual practice that we can make that business case for to strengthen businesses, um, to strengthen the uptake of those practices uh, for those producers that is going to benefit in the face of climate change. And so what are the kind of things I'm talking about? Um, improved seeds, nutrient management, integrated pest management, improved water management. There's a range of services and technologies um, that we can bundle together with things like climate information um, services, good agricultural practices, together with those commercialized services to provide the private sector extension services that can also augment our under-resourced public agricultural extension and water extension services. Um, and so that's a, uh, one of the new emphases um, that we've had um, at, at Winrock, and I'll talk about some of the partnerships um, a little bit later. On the environmental uh, sustainability side, um, this has also been an area that, that Winrock has been working for many decades and is something that we're passionate about. But too often, this has been siloed programming. Um, this has been environmental scientists leading sustainable landscape um, programs um, that have had tremendous impact uh, across the world. But too often, um, on our own teams, we had been siloed. Um, the flavor of money that was coming from our donors was separate programming, and it wasn't built into the sort of agriculture and water programming um, that my team was working with. And it's really only been in the last couple of years, at least for us, that these are becoming integrated, which is quite exciting. Um, now, what does that mean? It, as we take a look at these commercialized climate smart practices, as we take a look at the opportunities for increasing production, increasing efficiency, where are there opportunities to ensure that our practices are regenerative? And are we choosing practices that are not only profitable and productive, but have those regenerative qualities, um, both for our land, for our water, for our air, for our plants and animals? Are we leaving, of course, the environment in a better place than when we came? Um, at the very least, um, are we at least remaining neutral um, in a worst case scenario? And so how are we selecting the agricultural and economic interventions has to be driven with that in mind. Um, and at least for us, that is relatively new. Um, to do on the flavor of economic growth funding um, that we work on. I also want to uh, uh, appreciate Susie's comments on the payment for ecosystem services, um, as well as the opportunities for climate financing. Um, these are other opportunities to bring in much needed resources to communities 
um, uh, where resources can be generated um, from those industrial players and even voluntary carbon markets to be able to be able to provide those financial resources that are in short supply in resource poor environments and communities to be able to maintain um, the positive natural resource management practices. And uh, I'll give a couple examples in a little bit later where we're doing that at scale in places like Vietnam where over four million beneficiaries are directly benefiting from cash payments and uh, services um, from a uh, community managed forestry scheme. Over 500 million US dollars has been generated um, we're working on um, a similar model in Solomon Islands, as an example, to ensure clean water and the users of that water from an industrial perspective are setting up and signing up to pay for um, the, the reforestation of previously logged areas with the support of uh, indigenous communities who are leading this process on communal land. Um, so I think there's really exciting um, opportunities to increase our sustainability and the economic equation for these regenerative practices um, that are coming online now and for us being integrated in our solutions uh, for the first time, which I think is, is is quite exciting. Um, and then last, just on the social sustainability side, um, where we're really investing. And for us, we look at the enabling environment in and around how we organize uh, our societies. But where we're really digging in deep right now is how do we strengthen institutions at both that national, municipal, and community level. And I think they have been underfunded um, in terms of really thinking through what is the resource base to provide the services that the citizenry who has empowered um, those either uh, forms of uh, government or institutions institution has entrusted them. Um, and that means everything from how do we strengthen um, extension services for the increased need for climate smart practices. Um, we need these extension services to be more effective than they ever have been. Um, and yet they're quite weak. Um, how do we bring in both private sector and blended models um, for those extension services? How do we strengthen um, at the community level, the municipal level governments that are levying fees um, and uh, 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 implementing policies and licenses such that they're able to generate the enforcement and provision of water um, in their communities? And are we really taking into account the multiple uses um, from both a household and safe drinking water, um, agricultural production and, and livestock production from not only the usually older male um, perspective, but also inclusive of women youth and marginalized populations. Um, what's exciting for me is these are starting to come together, not just at Winrock, but also in partnering with USAID and USDA. These are becoming where our sector is moving, and I think it's quite exciting to be able to be that cross-disciplinary and really benefit from the learnings of the many organizations that have to be included um, for us to be successful. So it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, to share a couple of thoughts. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you for uh, bringing into this discussion not only the need for sustainability across our resources, but also across our social systems and communities that engage with our resources and, and are important for our food systems management. Transitioning to examples and specifically looking at the lens of data and analytics, Kahir, could you provide an overview of the role data and analytics play amongst these building blocks? Thanks so much, and it's a pleasure to, to join you uh, on this panel. <clears throat> um, and thank you, everyone, for, for coming out to BCG. Um, so I think one of the key things that we take um, when we um, think about this issue is the perspective of a decision maker. And oftentimes, you sit um, and you're looking at uh, a, a minister or somebody in the ministry or somebody in the corporation thinking about what is it that we need to do, and how do we do it? How do we optimize the value chains that we've been talking about? And um, they are inundated with data. They're inundated with information. There's information overload of what to do, how to do it, um, ideas, papers, everything coming at them from multiple angles. And the challenge that they face is how do we make sense of this? How do we make sense of it all? So the approach that we've taken, um, and I'll give an example of, 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 uh, of some work we've done in Egypt, um, is to bring data and analytics into the picture to allow for that analysis to sort of reach clear decisions that are evidence-based. Um, so 
the process that we've gone through um, is first build that evidence base. Look, use AI, use uh, geospatial analysis, understand issues, understand what is actually happening, that evidence base, genuine baseline to start with. From there, define and think about what are the interventions that need to be made, um, drawing in from all the ideas and all, all the other pieces of work that have come into the, to the fray, um, what will actually then have the biggest impact? Because you can model out what will have the most impact and then think through, well, we have the evidence base, we have a list of interventions and um, investments to make, what will be the, um, the, the, the impact, the differential impact of these different interventions, which are high value, which are low value, then think through sequencing them, what is the right sequence to, to, to implement them in, um, and then what can be funded by us? Uh, what can the government fund? It? What can the government fund? What can what's needed for pure um, grant money? What's uh, commercially viable, right? And let's bring in the private sector to have that discussion on what's commercially viable. So that process of building that evidence base uh, and using heavy data analytics to do that evidence base, then defining the interventions, then taking those interventions and developing that investment plan and roadmap um, is something that we've done, and that allows decision makers to have a more more clarity and more um, precision in the types of things that they do. It also demystifies how decisions are made because that data is available to everybody. So in Egypt, we've done this work um, in two value chains uh, recently, uh, the aquaculture and the maize value chain. So coming back to the question about feed and, and quality of, pro uh, of produce. Um, so in the maize value chain, um, 400,000 farmers across Egypt are um, engaged in that. Um, the it, it produces about 30% of the uh, Poultry is 30% of, um, of, the, of the protein diet of Egyptians, um, and maize is a key feed into that uh, value chain. And what, what was unclear was what do we do? How do we optimize this value chain? So we used data analytics, um, partnered with satellite companies, looked at um, the full geospatial analysis of Egypt, um, trained a model to understand across different seasons and identify what does a maize farm look like, um, and then mapped it out mapping out and you, you actually train the, the machine learning model to understand that these are the pictures, this is what a maize farm looks like, and at the end of the day, we had a clear map of what, um, where all these maize farms are in the country. That in itself was um, eye-opening because a lot of it is based on, evident, uh, on anecdotes but also on like on the ground you know, research and you missed pockets of where, um, this, um, uh, this, where production is happening. Layering onto that um, map um, was the question of where are the, wh what is the critical infrastructure for the value chain? Uh, where is the post-harvest production um, silos, uh, post-harvest production sites? Um, what are the roads? Um, what, are the, what is the social infrastructure that exists around this? And then with, you can see that there are, there are still gaps around the country and, and gaps in different places and starts to create this no notion of, well, if we make investments in specific places, you can optimize that value chain. And so that was really critical to think about. And through this process, you know, we identified specific places um, and specific impacts that different interventions would have. We did the same thing with aquaculture in Egypt um, and looking at the aquaculture value chain. Aquaculture is 42% of the, uh, the, the Egyptian diet uh, from, from a protein perspective. And um, a lot of the challenges in the aquaculture value chain are around um, cold chain, ice production, um, and wholesale markets. And when you look at where is the aquaculture being um, produced across the country, where, where are the wholesale markets, where is the ice producers, where is the, the cold chain, it, it works, but it's not optimized. And, and you can really think about how do you actually make a big difference in what you, what you do and which interventions you can place. So together with, with these two value chains, we re uh, resulted in a, a list of about 300 different interventions that you could prioritize, and you can actually say, these are the interventions we're gonna do because they have the highest value, highest impact uh, versus others. So you actually start to triage the interventions, most of them actually um, financeable by the private sector because they have a, there's a commercial business model, a uh, business case behind them because the data is there, that if you build it, you can actually make some money off of this. So then you can bring in the private sector to make the investments. Um, and you know, the, the a partnership with government was really critical here. So we worked with four different ministries, the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Planning, the Ministry of Inter um, Internal Trade, and the Ministry of Trade. 
and help them all get around that data so that the decisions that they made around where to allocate the resources, where to allocate the donor money, the grant money, their own money, um, and where to bring in the private sector was more clear and more precise. Um, and through that process, established with them a delivery unit that had these tools um, and had the ability to, tr to extend these tools from the two value chains to other value chains, like tomatoes and potatoes and um, wheat and other, um, other, other key products in the Egyptian economy. So establishing that delivery unit, building that capacity to help them make decisions was a critical aspect. So as I think about the, the core question that Emily, you asked, was around the, the building blocks for a sustainable system, you know, one key element of it is it has to start with clear evidence-based data um, and the analysis of that data in a way to make, it, to make sense of it on help decision makers um, achieve the right type of decisions that, that have the highest value. Thank you, Kahir. Yes, it's important to ensure that, uh, particularly in the light of policy and the implementation of policy, that is all founded in uh, data and in an accurate interpretation of that data. Just to round us off with this question, Eric, could you bring us back to looking at the systems level and at what we can learn from App's experience on systems thinking? Yeah, absolutely. So APT really, uh, APT Associates centers our work on systems thinking, whether that's in um, food systems or health systems or um, environmental management systems, we tend to think about how that system works and how can um, things that are not working well in that system be enhanced. Um, so we were really happy to see two years ago when um, USAID released the, the Food Systems Conceptual Framework that this framework gave a way to think about food systems in terms of this conceptual thinking to look at what are those um, investment driver, those investment levers and drivers um, on the elements of the food system itself, on the food supply, the food environment, um, food and water utilization, and how does that impact the development outcomes in diet, in income and health and uh, nutrition, and importantly in environmental sustainability, and how do all these things relate together? Um, so that was very much reflected the way that we had thought about um, working in the food system space previously, and I think it was a it was a good way for USAID to bring together that conceptual thinking. Um, I'm going to focus in a little bit today on an application of that that systems thinking into a country level. It happens to also be in Egypt. We sort of have an Egypt uh, theme going today. But APT has been implementing since 2018 the um, Egypt Agribusiness um, uh, Strengthening Program, which is really looking at how can the traditional smallholder farmers in Egypt, one of the oldest food systems in the world, the Egyptian irrigation perimeter has existed for thousands and thousands of years. And the, you know, the farms that are farmed today have been farmed with irrigated agriculture for thousands and thousands of years. But obviously, growing population pressure, changing you know, global food systems, and everything else has affected how those food systems work and how those food systems plug into other things. And what you are seeing in Egypt is those smallholder farmers, uh, often very, very small, just um, were not connected into those global food systems and those other areas. And that was leading to um, inequities and inequalities. Um, it was leading to farmers having very poor incomes. There's also some real challenges for the Egyptian farmer. Um, for food security purposes, Egyptian farmers are required to grow wheat um, in one of their three growing seasons. Um, Egypt's not a particularly efficient place to grow wheat, but it's also one of the biggest wheat importers in the world, and it doesn't want to have to import all of its wheat. Um, so this requirement that farmers grow wheat is a, is a real burden on farmers and puts a real, and while they get a guaranteed payment for that, it's a very small payment, but it puts a real burden on them to try to generate income um, through their other two growing seasons. And that's why horticulture is a really critical area for um, Egyptian smallholder farmers. So this program really focused on that issue of horticulture and that issue of how to connect smallholder farmers into um, the wider food systems and what were the partnerships that were necessary for that and what really allowed them to um, engage on equal terms um, with those um, input suppliers, with those buyers, um, everything else that, and exporters. Um, so as this program did that, I'll get a little bit deeper into the, the partnerships that we've established um, across the whole system with with the private sector, with government, with um, nonprofit organizations, with financial institutions. 
Um, we'll get into that a little bit later on. But um, one of the things that was very interesting for me coming in my role as chief climate officer um, into this program was looking at the sustainability questions. Um, this program was designed at an era where sustainability was looked at very separately from agriculture. It was 2018. You guys may remember that the United States was not really particularly focused on climate sustainability. Um, so we were looking to integrate climate into all the work that APP does um, across our whole portfolio. And this um, Egypt Agribusiness Project was actually the first program that we took through an initiative that we call the Climate Garage, where we take the project and we really workshop the program and say, okay, where are all the touch points with sustainability? What are the things that the program is already doing, should be doing, could be doing, and where are all the possibilities that we can both um, eliminate climate risk within this program and rigorously look at climate risk, as well as finding opportunities for mitigation, finding opportunities for injecting sustainability into this program. What was very interesting when we did this, we workshopped this opportunity, we workshopped this program with um, uh, the program team. We also had some of the, the agribusiness partners um, that work with the program very actively. Um, things like uh, fruit and vegetable processors that were in the room with us as we were doing this workshopping. And there were some people who looked at it and said, uh, you know, climate, not a big problem in Egypt. We have sustainable water supply from the river. Um, we have a climate that is warm all the time. You know, the, the crops produce. There was a real wake up call when the, the general manager, I'll, I'll never forget uh, the, the gentleman, um, Hatem El Tawil, who was in the room with us, who said, wait a minute, climate is a problem in Egypt. Um, we have factories that can produce seven, that can process 700 metric tons per day of tomatoes. Um, and that's a huge, huge um, output of tomato being processed into tomato paste and other products. Um, and they had to shut down for two months because of freezing temperatures, freezing temperatures in Egypt. Um, that's not something that they've ever had to deal with in climate vulnerability, uh, climate variability. And that really woke up, and this wasn't in the far north of Egypt, this was actually in the southern um, part of Egypt and up what they call upper Egypt. Um, that was a real wake up call to that group to say, okay, this is an issue. We have to look at climate risk. We have to look at how are we thinking about growing seasons? How are we look, thinking about variability? Um, how are we thinking about how we inject um, climate sustainability into the program? And that really um, prioritized some of the interventions that were already being done or had already been conceived of um, to be broader in areas like um, improved water management, strengthening soil fertility, um, uh, better planting practices, and working towards more resilience in that agricultural sector. But even beyond that, uh, same, same gentleman, um, we started to talk about uh, mitigation, climate mitigation, and the fact that um, the, the pulp from his product, which was already being sold off as organics, um, as compost, um, was potentially a fuel source. Um, when they looked at this from an agribusiness perspective, their largest cost, other than buying tomatoes, was buying natural gas. And it turns out that tomato pulp, of which there were several hundred tons a day, um, tomato pulp can be processed through anaerobic digestion to collect the methane out of it and turned into natural gas that potential business case really also set off um, bells to say, here's the opportunity to make the, the, the whole system more sustainable. Um, so that climate garage intervention really allowed a, a wake up call to say there are a lot of sustainability possibilities within this program. Some of them are things we're already doing that can be scaled up. Some of them are um, things that need to be done anew. Some of them are things that can be done at the farm level. Some of them are things that can be done you know, across the whole agribusiness value chain. Um, and it also allowed us to launch into some new thinking and new thoughts around um, things like climate finance. And now we're working with um, Rabobank Acorn on how to um, develop a product so that um, smallholder farmers can access climate finance for agroforestry activities that are happening on the farm. And that's um, something that's very challenging to do at a small home or farmer level. It's uh, much easier to do at a plantation agriculture level, but to do it at a small level is quite difficult. 
So I'll get uh, a little bit more into the, into the areas of partnerships and, and justice further on, but um, overall, that's a, a little bit of the look that we do and what taking this sort of systematic look at the whole agribusiness system and how connecting those small homeowner farmers into the agribusiness system um, can really be helpful at looking at that, uh, that sustainable system. Thank you, Eric, and thank you for highlighting uh, the lens of working across the entire food system. So we're looking at sustainability across each of the sectors within the food system. Given you still have the mic, perhaps you could kick us off on the next question, which is now coming to discuss specifically around partnerships and uh, inclusive and just processes for those partnerships. So Eric, perhaps you could just let us have a better understanding of what an effective and inclusive partnering is. Yeah, it's a challenging question, and I think it's very um, it's very contextually dependent. Um, partnering depends on who are the actors in that food system, um, what are the power dynamics within that food system, and what are the the relationships um, that exist and um, need to be strengthened, need to be shifted within that food system. Um, for us, in the context of this um, ERAS project in Egypt, um, the really key partnership is with farmer associations. Um, these associations of farmers are critical um, for delivering um, technical assistance on um, agricultural practices. We work directly with the associations. The associations work with their members um, to introduce new planting practices, soil fertility practices, um, what we call low-cost, no-cost solutions, which is really at the center of this program. We help um, develop the capacity of the associations to work with their farmers in them. But they're also really critical for marketing channels, and they're really critical as providers for rural and community development and social services. Um, for example, as we really work to shine a light on um, women within these agricultural value chains, the Egyptian agricultural sector, in particular horticulture, is dominated by men. It's not something that you know, is, has women in leadership roles. But there are examples where there are women who are leading and managing farms, running businesses in the marketing system and others. Um, and those agricultural um, producer associations have really been critical to help um, take those positive examples that exist um, and use them as cases to show women um, that are part of these associations the leadership roles that they can play and identify those positive role models and start to shift that balance a little bit. But the other partnerships that are really critical beyond that sort of key intervention point of the farmer associations are obviously the private sector agribusiness firms, which are critical throughout the food system. Um, one of those is um, input suppliers. And we work with global suppliers like BASF. Um, we also work with local suppliers. There's a really critical company that worked with called Cheetah Sand Egypt that provides organic um, fertilizer that helps with that um, soil sustainability through organic fertilizer. But connecting these um, suppliers into these smallholder farmers is an important thing because there are whole areas of the country that didn't have access to certain agricultural inputs. So helping um, build bridges between those producer associations, those suppliers often setting up the local franchisee in a particular region or area um, can be very critical. Um, and um, often signing long-term contracts between those input suppliers and those farmer associations so they have predictable and reliable access to those supplies. Um, financial institutions are really critical as well, and we've worked with financial institutions in Egypt, particularly microfinance institutions, because they're working at the scale that these smallholder farmers need to access, and working with those MFIs to develop specific agricultural credit products that work to the needs of those farmers as they um, link themselves, A, as they produce their product, but A, as they link themselves into the agricultural um, value chains and the broader agribusiness. Um, I mentioned the Rabobank Acorn example of, of climate finance, but there's also just traditional um, agricultural um, credit um, needs. Um, agro-processors and pack houses are, are really critical, particularly in horticulture. Um, horticulture has been grown in Egypt for years, but it's really been sold through traditional markets, and the, the incomes that farmers get through, get through that have been relatively low. Connect, uh, and health and safety is a critical issue um, to make sure that that agricultural produce can reach um, the standards that both um, Egyptian national and international global markets um, can access. So we worked very closely on the government side with the new, um, I'm going to get the name wrong, but the, the, the food health and safety organization that was started in Egypt, um, and then worked down through um, the packing um, system, the export marketers and others 
to help make sure that they were complying with international standards. And as they brought fruit from smallholder farmers um, and brought vegetables, whether that was tomatoes or it was mangoes or it was strawberries, those things could reach the standards that could um, be exported into the international markets. Um, also really critical chains in transportation, obviously. Um, things like a, a pack house that's located near Luxor Airport, which has direct flights into Europe, um, allows export agriculture to happen in a way that um, increases those farmer incomes. Um, we also um, have worked directly with a lot of the, the companies that are purchasing. For example, there's a, a really critical company um, called Daltex that, we've, um, that is a basal um, processor. It's one of the largest suppliers to McCormick, um, and McCormick is a huge purchaser of um, herbs and spices around the world. Um, and much of their supply now comes from Egypt. Um, so McCormick right here in Maryland is um, shipping out basil from Egypt, processing it properly to their standard and being able to get it in. And that's because of a, a marketing agreement and a long-term contract that was um, put in place between Dalmac as the, Daltex as the inter, as intermediary um, and those um, Egyptian smallholder farmers. We also work with um, civil society and NGOs, not just on the sort of, um, uh, Pro community development programs I was talking about, but also on the, the offtake from the agricultural products. Um, Egypt is a country, like most, that have rich and poor, um, and there's a great deal of inequality in the country. Um, and a really critical institution for nutrition um, is the Egyptian Food Bank. Um, so making arrangements with the Egyptian Food Bank as a purchaser of products um, has made sure that the, the Egyptian diet, which is really very dependent on um, subsidized bread for the poor um, also has access to the nutrition that comes from fruit and vegetables um, and creating direct linkages and um, long-term marketing agreements between the suppliers and the Egyptian Food Bank has been a, a critical thing for this program as well. And finally, government. I mentioned the National Food Safety Authority, but we've also more recently um, in the global food crisis, we've begun working with wheat and um, post-harvest handling, transportation storage of wheat is a really critical issue. Um, that's a nationalized system in Egypt, so working with the government grain elevators, um, working to make sure that uh, A, the, the quantity of grain storage is being improved, and B, the ability to do, uh, to store it without um, loss and particularly theft um, is an enormous issue in Egypt, especially in the context of, of extreme food insecurity from the, from the Ukraine crisis. Um, so that's a little bit about partnerships and where we're at. As you can see, it's, it's really a vast array of partnerships. Um, but what this program has centered on is making sure that the that smallholder farmer through its association is able to equitably engage in all these partnerships and is able to um, uh, be able to um, uh, enter agreements that are on honest are on good terms and acting as an honest broker has been really critical in that um, and that's that's a lot of the value that this program adds. Thanks, Eric. It's good to have a case study that highlights all the different partnerships in action across the entire food system. Bringing it to uh, a little broader perspective, Susie, from WWF's experience, what is critical to the implementation of long-term solutions within these partnerships? Thank you. Yeah, there are a number of things that I want to call out, and then I'll give one specific, um, talk about one specific area of engagement that I think highlights these. Um, so a couple of things I'll call out. Um, certainly local community engagement and inclusion are really critical to effective partnering, thinking about how any partnership is going to impact those on the ground in the area where the partnership is going to um, have an impact play out is going to be really uh, important to thinking about how that is going to have a long-term role. This is particularly important for the local communities, indigenous peoples, um, making sure that they're heard and included in what that is going to look like. Um, thinking about the value chain of what that partnership is looking to do, what are all of the pieces up and down the value chain to thinking about how that is going to be successful over the long term, really thinking through those pieces is, is really critical. Um, this means thinking about public and private sector engagement, NGO 
um, the key sectors that are going to be involved in what that, whatever that partnership um, is included. Um, what are those voices? What is that going to mean? What are those engagements um, involve? And then just the the key the key pieces: the what and the how, the cultural and the economic, the social and the science. Um, these are all key key pieces. So then honing in on one um, one specific example of a partnership that is really important um, for WWF is our engagement with Native nations here in the U.S. and thinking about this in terms of food security and conservation, um, the role of buffalo and grasslands and food security. Um, I think everyone knows about, you know, we pretty much drove buffalo into um, almost into extinction and bringing them back is very important important for a number of reasons and particularly in our partnership with Native Nations and thinking about that from the perspective of grassland conservation and restoration from the cultural importance to Native Nations and for their food security and the cultural importance to them. Um, and as we have worked with Native Nations and trying to look at that from and work with them and supporting them um, in the importance that that plays from um, a wildlife perspective, from the role they play in their culture, and from the food security perspective, it has been very eye-opening and a huge learning experience for our organization in learning the programmatic hurdles that they have faced, the land tenure um, uh, issues that they face in trying to work through the programs to try to bring Buffalo back, bring them back onto their lands, navigate the programmatic hurdles to um, accessing different programs, to um, uh, access different forms of assistance that are more easily accessible to um, other communities, and, just, and also build the infrastructure to um, bring that back into their food system and the really fascinating hurdles, to put it one way, that that brings into play when they look at the scale that most of those infrastructure programs play at is very different from what they're trying to uh, to build and will really work at in order to um, raise the buffalo and process them for their own community is really out of sync with what most agencies are working at. Um, so they're in then trying to play out those partnerships to uh, try to essentially rewire some of those programs to fit into that more community setting and those kind of partnerships. Um, so there's a lot of hurdles to overcome to take partnerships like that and try to look at the programs that are available and say, all right, how do we make those work for partnerships like this and community settings like that? Thank you, Susie. Uh, moving on to Kahir, if you could provide an example from BCG and perhaps more broadly thinking of, of partnerships along the line, as we've heard from WWF, perhaps from a different perspective. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good question. Um, so I think one of the things that we, we think about in, the, in um, partnerships is um, the power dynamics, right? Uh, and power dynamics have a really critical um, influence on whether you get a good deal or not, right? So as a, as a small holder or a low-income partner, Farmer, um, you know, are you actually getting the deal that you're um, that, that you should be getting? Are you getting paid the right amount that you should be getting? Um, and what is the role of different um, actors in the whole ecosystem? So we take a, a, an ecosystem perspective and thinking through this very specifically, like what is the power dynamic in a particular decision framework? Um, and coming back to what I said earlier about the importance of data um, and having a clear evidence base is when you start to make some of that available and make it more um, uh, accessible, um, it allows for um, very uh, a, a bit more dem democratization of a decision, right, or of a of a partnership, because everyone then ha is working off of the same data. It's demystifying the type of decisions that have been made. It's allowing for uh, farmers to actually see um, what uh, the ultimate prices might be, what share they're getting, what the cost of processing would be. And so we applied some of these dynamics um, in, in Egypt in those same similar examples I mentioned before and um, tried to increase the, the, the value share of, of the farmer. So, so that's one of the, the cr critical elements I think is, is important to, uh, to bring to, um, to light and, and really addressing that, that power dynamic across different um, uh, team um, ecosystem players. Thank you, Kahir. And it's important to ensure equity across the entire uh, partnerships 
and uh, using evidence to help support that is, is key here and, and, and uh, useful for you to highlight. Handing it over to you, Aaron, to, to finish us off with this question, if you have any additional thoughts from WinRock's perspective. Sure, thanks, Emily, and just want to thank the panelists. I think there's been so much shared on, on the topic. I, I, I won't repeat, but I'm fully uh, appreciating that ecosystems approach, and it takes um, uh, the key stakeholders from across the different sectors. So I won't repeat all of that that our colleagues already said. The one piece I would add on is one of the things that uh, I just wanted to reemphasize is the importance, and Kahir just brought up the power dynamics, that these partnerships truly are locally led. Um, and that the, the incentive structure is aligned uh, with their needs and not the needs of the project. Um, and we've gotten that wrong in places. And as an example, um, we have partnered with the private sector where they were incentivized because of uh, grants or cost sharing to do things that ultimately they weren't interested in but were subsidized to do. And as soon as the project ended, those ended. That's what we don't want to do. So all partnership with the private sector isn't positive. Um, and so how can we rethink and revisit that? And so what we've really tried to do is look at where are those headwinds, if you will, in the different countries and contexts where we can align with what's already working. And so a couple of examples, um, starting maybe in Nigeria in our agriculture or extension and advisory service uh, program, what we've tried to do is work together, um, as uh, referenced earlier, our approach of partnering with um, the producer groups, farmer cooperatives, and um, uh, uh, the variety of different uh, uh, producing organizations, um, including women's organizations, um, together with the private sector to identify those commercializable practices and jointly flesh out the business model of some of these new technologies and services. Um, and so specifically in, in that particular program, we're working in five value chains, um, including aquaculture, which I was happy to hear as uh, some references here today, as, as that's also been a hallmark of uh, some of the work that we've been doing. Identifying those practices together and one doesn't have to be uh, an African expert to know you want to align with the entrepreneurial spirit in Nigeria. Um, where you can make the case for increased profit um, both at the producer level and as at the at the business level people get it. Um, it has to make financial sense. At the same time, there's a population base that's um, attractive enough for international investors to bring real money um, into these equations. And so getting our financial institutions on board, aligning the agribusinesses um, that are interested and the producers around a business model that is going to have regenerative and profit motive um, behind it, is going to work. Uh, and I'm happy to say on this particular program, we just had our midterm evaluation. Um, and we're able to mobilize over 400,000 small scale farmers, 40% of which uh, were women, to generate an additional 1.2 billion US dollars in additional sales of these new adapted services and products. Um, over 600,000 hectares by small scale farmers. Um, and so that scale um, is achievable in a place like Nigeria. We have a similar program um, that's related in Senegal. And again, the entrepreneurial spirit in Dakar and around Senegal with international investment aligning to both multinational corporations as well as national, there is real capital that's looking for um, innovation and looking for investments. Um, where as we as a project can strengthen those businesses, those ecosystems of um, incubator hubs, of business support services for those entrepreneurs, for those agribusinesses to both strengthen their business models and look for new opportunities that they can serve more geographically uh, marginalized populations. Um, many times, uh, it seems obvious again, but many times they're not thinking about women in the boardroom of these agribusinesses. Um, it's generally uh, male leaders, and they're not thinking it from a, from a female perspective. How can we ensure that we're trying to reach um, to the entire population and thinking about um, the needs of each of those different demographics
demographic groups and bringing women into the boardroom and as well as um, trying to address some of those financial hurdles that women in marginalized communities face. How do we work together with those financial institutions to try to develop products that they can access and are affordable? And I'm happy to say we're having some results um, in, in those spaces. On the opposite side, aligning and appreciated uh, Susie's comments of aligning with uh, traditional and indigenous leadership um, as well. Maybe just a couple of examples. In uh, Niger and <coughs> Burkina Faso, we're implementing a program called Terra V, which is part of the Rise to uh, Consortium of Programs, if uh, those of you that work in the Sahel um, uh, region. And we've been partnering with traditional leaders to develop local conventions around both land and water management um, in these resource scarce environments. Um, there has been long um, held conflict between agriculturalists and pastoralists as they have uh, really literally battle for access to um, water as well as um, the land access where animals trample and feed on agricultural um, products. And so we've worked together with those traditional leaders, um, uh, really replicating a model that USAID helped fund um, about 10, 15 years ago on these local conventions um, to develop the detailed um, plans for agricultural pastoralist use of land. Um, what are the access rights of pastoralist populations? What are the use rights um, of the waters? Looking at um, equitable and inclusive use of uh, the, the different water user groups of our household and, and drinking water group for um, our humans as well as the livestock and agricultural needs. Um, bringing in, to Kahir's point, some of the data analytics of this, of doing some of the water resource mapping, both of the groundwater and surface water, so that those traditional leaders and inclusive leadership um, teams really have a good understanding quantitatively the um, the water they have access to in their communities. How do we prioritize and how do we put together those conflict mechanisms such that we can resolve conflicts when they occur? And I'm happy to say in um, Niger, we've been able to reduce conflict in the participating communities by as much as 50% um, in, in those communities. And at, in Burkina, um, as they've gone through a number of political transitions and have a military government, um, the government, the official, uh, uh, administrative government um, has really faltered um, as we bring in military um, officers to run government ministries and municipal governments. What has succeeded in the face of this is the traditional leadership structures um, that have maintained really outside of the government. They've been able to continue these programs and be successful in the face of uh, conflict and political instability. Um, what, just one more example from a, a different region in the uh, Pacific Islands, in the Solomon Islands. Um, we're working on a, a program uh, called SCALE, um, but really it's taking a look at natural resource management and integrating um, uh, food security and economic agricultural-led economic growth um, into the Solomon Islands, some of the, the marginalized populations there. But what is going on in Malaita province that, that we're working in, the most populous province in Solomon Islands, is there has been international logging companies that have come in and clear-cut um, wide swaths of uh, tropical rainforest um, for the valuable hardwoods. And often what was happening is one or $200,000 cash payments was going to some of these uh, headmen in these uh, in some of the areas. Um, and so to be able to combat that, it's a really a unique situation where around 85% of the land in Malaita province and generally throughout Solomon Islands is generally communal land. Um, and so some of the, those traditional leaders really have purview over the land, um, but also there's long-held land disputes um, that have been decades old and are quite acrimonious. 
Um, one of the things that has been an innovation that we've been partnering together with those indigenous communities is a process called indigenous terrain mapping um, that they've identified, which literally means going in a community by community basis, um, working with those traditional leaders to map the entire genealogy um, of the different communities and families uh, within that uh, small community so that we can identify where each person falls on the land access and ownership rights for the community so that we can then identify where do the payments ultimately go for a payment of ecosystem services scheme uh, for reforestation and for water access use um, as well as for fisheries. Um, there hasn't been a consensus on who owns what and what is the um, the joint ownership, how those resources are being utilized. And so because there wasn't um, a consensus on who is due what, um, uh, uh, what in that situation and the use of those resources, head men were taking advantage. But by empowering and solving some of those land tenure issues, which have been extremely challenging and taking us about two years um, to do in just a few communities. But we think that has real potential to now have a long-term stream of resources going through those jointly owned, um, uh, uh, receiving those uh, through the community structures to fund jointly uh, agreed projects in, in those communities. So I think partnering with those that traditional leadership structure um, is going to give us real opportunities to have breakthroughs that that uh, that have been um, real bottlenecks for development for a long time. Thank you, Aaron. So we've talked about uh, the challenges that we face, the need for sustainable long-term solutions and partnerships that are important across those solutions. I'd like to come finish us off today with final thoughts around uh, some of the, the, the solutions that uh, we are mentioning in our various example, examples and really hone into the just aspect of those solutions. How do we ensure that we implement inclusive and just solutions? Just finishing off again this discussion with that question, with, with, uh, with your final comments. Um, I'll start off with Kahir. So what it does it mean from, from BCG's perspective to have just solutions? Yeah. Um I think when we think about a just tr transition or just solutions, ultimately it's about people and it's about the quality of life that people live and ensuring that their quality of life doesn't diminish when transitions happen. And in fact, that transitions are opportunities for their quality of life to uh, get stronger and better and, and, and more um, more effective. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll stick with the theme of data analytics. I mean, there's one really critical aspect of um, applying data analytics and what we do um, in our commercial practices is thinking about this notion of a segment of one. Like if I want to, if, if, if a large multinational corporation wants to sell a product, the, the most effective way of really coming to and saying, what does this particular individual market segment of one person, what does that person need? What do they want? What's the right thing to sell to them? And I think we can apply the same concepts um, in, um, in development and in, in this particular uh, topic that we've been discussing. And we've done that actually when we've done some work with the World Food Program in Kenya, where we looked at what is the differential impact at the household level, specific household level of drought. Um, and what's gonna happen when there's a drought, what's gonna be the impact on this family that lives you know, at you know, 201 on the street versus the family that lives across the street on, on 202. And what, what, what is the difference there? What is the makeup of that family? Is it women-led? Is it um, minority-led? Is it a uh, single parent? Is it whatever. You can actually think about that, define it, have that data, and then think about the solution that needs to come to that specific family. And the impact of that or that individual and the impact of that is incredible amount of differential um, intervention. Um, social protection payments get, you know, get targeted in the most effective way. Um, but also, um, you know, the overall cost, before it was just spread the peanut butter, everybody gets, you know, 50 bucks. Well, now you know that this family needs some really specific element of what intervention that they need, how much money they need, what the protection they need is, and uh, what the other family might need is something very different. So really thinking about using um, those sorts of practices in this concept of just transition can be very powerful. Thank you, Kahir. 
And we're just going to pass it along the line here. Aaron, again, final thoughts, final comments, honing in to the specifics around your various examples of what is a just and inclusive solution. Thanks for raising that. I think it's such an important discussion. And, you know, first we want to say that the current system we don't think is a just system. Um, it doesn't protect the environment, does not protect human health, doesn't produce enough nutritious food, doesn't distribute it e equitably um, across. And so we're currently not living up to expectations um, in terms of that current food system. Uh, we also have to acknowledge the role and the legacy of colonialism that has played both here in the US as well as globally. Um, and how do we address the change in um, agricultural practices for food systems um, that previously had been um, adapted to the local context, um, had been generally um, environmentally uh, positive. Um, how do those were replaced by clear cunning and environmentally destructive um, uh, agricultural and, and food system um, that was really focused on profit? Um, it has systemically um, uh, preferenced uh, people that look like myself that have been uh, white and male here in the US and has looked differently um, in other countries. How do we address uh, some of those systemic situations? And I think that looks differently in different places. Um, I'm happy to say uh, Winrock uh, works both in the US and does development programming trying to counter um, some of those historic um, uh, inequities in the US food system and working on providing access to finance for um, uh, farmers uh, of color as well as uh, women um, as one small example. And on the international side, um, one of the areas that I've spent a bit of time the last few years in Zimbabwe is how do we demaze um, some of these increasingly drying districts um, and move back towards sorghum and millets that have been more nutritious, had been more climate adapted, um, and looking at all of those implications in terms of uh, food choice, uh, food preferences that have changed um, over time. Um, in, in addition, working with local communities and community-owned seed um, organizations so that they can ensure that they have the patents for the indigenous-owned seed varieties. Um, and so the international seed companies don't come in and take some of the intellectual property um, uh, from these communities because they know the paperwork. And so how do we support communities to make those, um, uh, those technical leaps that wouldn't come um, naturally to them. Um, and I think access to finance as well is, is a critical component of how do we ensure those systemically marginalized populations have access to finance when they don't have um, all of the assets collateral um, that uh, a, a formal banking system requires. I, I think we owe it to those communities that have been marginalized to be able to invest in those areas. And I think there's a lot we could say, but just uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Aaron. Yes, there is a lot to discuss and to, to share with this topic. Uh, Susie, again, final thoughts. Yeah. Uh, keep keep take home messages. Yeah, I'll be I'll be brief because I think we've already covered a lot of ground, and I think it's really just creating the resilient food and agriculture system that can meet the nutritional needs of a growing population, meet um, and address climate change, it, um, uh, protect biodiversity and nature, um, and have respect for cultures and equity and inclusion. Um, access to land and food sovereignty are huge issues. It's a very big challenge, and I think uh, three key building blocks of this are ensuring that we're keep pressing on and ensuring that we have the science and data to understand what we need, the partnerships to um, be able to build the solution and um, being really creative and open-minded to the policies to uh, support all of this. So. Thank you, Susie. And Eric, last quick comments and thoughts finishing off us, finishing us off today. Yeah, I mean, kind of pulling together all of what we said here, I'm, I'm going to come out to a global frame for a second because I'm I'm starting to prep for COP28 and thinking about how can how can the countries of the world solve this problem. And I think whether I think about what Susie's talked about in terms of protein systems that are um, clearing forests for grazing or what we're facing in Egypt where um, plantation horticulture in the desert is getting access um, to world markets and exports where the smallholder farmers aren't. 
I think you know one of the really key things that all of us have hit upon here is uh, I've worked in a lot of interdisciplinary spaces, so forgive my head for a second. I'm going to greenfield and brownfield. Um, when you're looking at a new project, you can look at a greenfield site, a brand new place, or a brownfield site that needs to be redeveloped for it. It's a real estate concept. Um, in agriculture, we have demand for more and more food, more and more protein, more and more nutrition around the world. From a business standpoint, the tendency is to go to the greenfield site, go to the place where you can clear the forest, you can do grazing for your animals, go to the place where you can get a plot of land, maybe in the desert, but you can bring in water. But that has so many environmental consequences to it, we have to resist that temptation. We have to resist the, the temptation to solve our food systems problems with greenfield sites, and we have to invest in what real estate people would call brownfield sites. Brownfield sites are places where we've been doing agriculture for hundreds and thousands of years, and they have people in those sites who have been left behind and have not been connected into um, a lot of the technologies that have been easier to adopt in greenfield sites. It's really critical to bring those people in, make sure they've got access to the technologies that are gonna allow them to be resilient in the face of climate change, in the face of um, scarce water and other resources, and we've got to make sure that that part of the food system um, that is where we have been producing food is as productive as possible um, to solve this demand that we have and resist that temptation to, to move into those greenfield sites. And I think that's a, that's a people problem, it's a technology problem, it's a land use problem. Um, there's a lot of other elements to it, but we've got to make sure we're wrapping all that together and make sure that that investment is um, in sustainable and just food systems. Thank you, Eric. Today was a very rich discussion and we hit our panelists with some very complex and challenging questions. So we really appreciate your answers and your insight. We look forward to working together further on these challenges. I wanna hand it back to BCG, to Trish for closing remarks before we end today. Thanks everyone. Thank you all for a really great discussion. I'm gonna scan awkwardly close to Emily because our camera is no longer moving. Um, first, um, Emily, thank you for moderating the discussion and for kind of inspiring us all together today. It was great to have you. Um, I really appreciated um, DA Obama's uh, comments at the beginning. It was great to start the day you know, with a strong reminder about the importance of inclusive approaches to development, you know, particularly in the space of food systems, you know, where she reminded us that over 40% of the labor force are women. So you know, it's such an important way to start the day. Um, and then really enjoyed um, all of you. So thanks so much for joining us. Susie, I loved um, you starting with such a clear articulation of, of the building blocks of the food systems and kind of bringing us back to that um, throughout the discussion. Erin loved the, dis you know, the discussion of the economic sustainability side, the social parts of this, and really protecting livelihoods through the process. And also the reminder around um, local leadership um, as we build partnerships. Kahir, you speak to my heart when you talk about data analytics and the importance of bringing good information that's actionable to decision makers, and also really thinking about the balance of power and the incentives in partnerships. And then Eric loved your voice in this conversation, you know, reminding us about the importance of risk of the climate and also the opportunities that come with climate finance and of course the systems approach. So really, I don't know how I summarize the conversation as rich and as complex as it was, but really um, enjoy the opportunity. Um, for those of you that are here, welcome you to, to stick around um, and chat with our panelists. I know we didn't have a chance for Q&A, so um, please stay um, and enjoy the time. And for those of you uh, joining online, uh, hope to see you soon. Thanks everybody. <laughs>